1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18 instead of 17. Continuing on our, our series on Elijah and Elisha and their experiences with God. So last chapter, we focused on Elijah's experiencing God's care. Remember the provision by the ravens and the widow and the healing that came. This chapter, we're going to see Elijah experiences God's power. God's power. This is a real power chapter. Now, not only because it's about God's power, but because it's long. It's a long chapter. And it's going to, con going to have several displays of God's power. But we have to start with just getting the story going. So we're going to start by reading verses 1 to 5. Just let me just give this introduction here. We left the prophet Elijah in pro living in obscurity. He was living out of Israel in Zarephath, being taken care of by a widow. Okay, It does not appear that either the increase of the provision, you know, the fact that he was, um, the oil and meal were never running out. Apparently that and the raising from the dead of the child, of the widow, even those things no, nobody had taken much notice of in Zarephath. Had it become a big thing, you say, well, you'd think people would be you know, aware of that. You'd think that that would get some fame for poor Elijah. No. Remember, he's hiding. He's hiding because um, Ahab wants to kill him because he said it would not rain. And so he's been in obscurity. But here's the thing. I don't think Elijah cared that nobody knew. And I want to make a point about the fact that nobody knew he was doing these great works. That's good because here it is. We need to be one who would rather do good. This is our first point. We're jumping in. Remember, every time you see the arrows, that's a lesson for us today. Be one who would rather do good than be known to do good. Be one who would rather do good than be known to do good. I think that what messes up some ministers of the Lord, some people with ministries, is that they start off just doing good. What God gives them to do. Miracles even. But then they end up being more concerned about being known for doing good. And the fame or the attention they get actually ends up destroying their ministry because they're focused on that. We have to realize that we are the vessel that God is using. Let me read this passage in Matthew 6 because I think Elijah was a good illustration of this. He was doing what God had him do, but he wasn't doing it. He was doing it in obscurity. It didn't matter that nobody saw it. He was just doing what God gave him to do. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. See, you're still practicing righteousness, but with a different goal. In order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. If we keep our focus on doing what God sees, only God, and not have any concern that somebody else know we did it, we will do the very best, I believe, at serving him. And he's, what Jesus says here is those people who gave them attention, I hope they enjoyed it because that's their reward. While you do it in secret and only God knows, you get your reward from him. How much better? And he knows the best ways to give rewards too. It might be making the garage door work when you didn't think it could. <laughs> or letting you pay far, far less for the service you need. Let God be your rewarder, not what people see. Be one who would rather do good than be known to do good. Amen? Amen. So now he's coming out. Now remember, he went into hiding not because he was afraid, but because that's how God directed him. 
Now God's going to give him another direction. 1 Kings 18, 1 to 16. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, that is many days, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Now it hasn't rained for those three years. So, so Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab, now we go over to the palace and see what's happening there. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over his household. Now Obadiah, we get a note here about Obadiah. Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So that's what we know about Obadiah. And he's the head of Ahab's household. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. So God directs Ahab. Now it's time to go face Ahab. And now I'm going to give them the rain that I've been holding back. So meanwhile, Ahab and Obadiah, Ahab says, you know what? I'm so concerned about our people dying. I mean, our animals. Um, interesting thing about Ahab, his concern was not that his people have no water or food, but that his animals have no water or food. Do you wonder why? He doesn't want his horses and mules. Why? Animals are what would be used in the case of attack. They were for his defense. But what about his people? He doesn't seem to have much of a heart for his people. So this section, I didn't give you it. It's called Elijah meets Obadiah. Elijah meets Obadiah. But before we get to that meeting, we'll just look a little bit about this idea. Um, the top of your next side, you'll see it says, we should care for the animals that serve us. I'm not saying we shouldn't. The Bible says we should. We should care for the animals that serve us. Proverbs 12.10 says this, Whoever is righteous has regard for the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. What this is actually saying is, it's, well, it makes a statement about taking care of, caring for our, regarding our, our, those animals that serve us, the point of this is even a man who, even a good man is, even his mercy toward an animal is so much greater than an evil man whose mercy looks cruel. That's as merciful as he gets. But the point is we are to take care. I believe it's good to take care of the animals that serve us. However, we need to remember they are not the same as people. I hope I'm not stepping on anyone's toes, but this is a biblical principle. We had a woman come to our church once and, and she was coming for a while and then she, my dad was a pastor, it was in Westminster, and then she wanted to know if he would tell her that her dog was going to heaven. And my dad would not tell her that. There's nothing, no biblical reason for us to know that that dog goes to heaven. I'm not saying that Bible says it doesn't, it doesn't give any indication the animals on earth go to heaven. So we can't say they do, sorry. I'm not really sorry, but that's a truth. And here's why. There's some differences here. And in our world today, sometimes things have gotten so reversed. Anything that takes a truth and changes it, and it doesn't seem that bad, but it's perverting the truth. I'm sorry, but sometimes I think our, our budgets in our state, in our country, are giving more money to taking care of animals that can take care of themselves than to educating our children taking care of, you know, the human kids. And we have to be careful. And it isn't that we shouldn't be kind to animals or take care of animals. The point is we have to get our priorities right. And we can't, any perversion of the truth keeps us from doing what is exactly God's way. So here's the difference in case you wondered or in case people ask you. Animals are not the same as people who were formed, not spoken into existence. 
Genesis 2, 7. It's going to apply to several here. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground. Understand, he spoke animals into existence. If you read Genesis, in the accounts in Genesis 1 and 2, it says he said, let there be, and there were. He spoke animals into existence. He spoke trees into existence. He spoke the sun, moon, and stars into existence. But he formed man from the dust of the earth. It separates mankind. Secondly, we were given, people were given life by the breath of God. That happened with no other animals, no other beings. Finishing that verse or reading it again. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. There's a difference. Mankind came from the form of God's forming them and breathing life into them, into us. And it separates us, and I believe that breath of God is what gave man a living soul. That is what separates us from the animals. As much as people like to, scientists or, or biologists, they like to compare that we're like this and we're like this, and it also is against evolution. Those animals coming down and becoming suddenly people with no breath of God, there's nothing biblical in that. It's the breath of God that breathes life into mankind and separates us from the animals. It's okay, it's great to take care of animals, but don't ever give them a value equal to mankind. That's what we're saying. So not, they were formed, they were given life by the breath of God. They have, people have God-ordained dominion, dominion over animals. That also separates us. He didn't give any of the animals dominion over other animals. He didn't say, you lions, you're the king of beasts. You blue whales, you're the king of the oceans. You eagles, you're the king of the air. He didn't do any of that with any of the animals. But what he did do is he gave man, the one he formed from the dust and breathed life into, he said, you have dominion over all animals. Again, it separates mankind from animals. There's some responsibilities that come with that dominion, and that's, what we're, what I'm, that's okay. But we need to understand the separation of animals and people. And finally, we are made in the image of God. Mankind... Human people are made in the image of God. Genesis 1.26 Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, made in the image of God, breathed life into us, dominion over all animals formed by God's very hands. There is definitely something special about mankind that separates us from the animals and that tells us we didn't come from them. We did not evolve from animals. So I just wanted to point that out. I think that one of the commentaries I read said, even though Ahab was so wicked, he cared about his animals, so he must have really been good at heart. I'm like, he cared about winning battles. And I, I don't compare taking care of your mules and donkeys and horses and ignoring the need of people. And he continued in his sin that was resulting in this famine. That was because of him, which we'll see as we continue here. All right, so what do we know about Obadiah? Here's this, suddenly this, another, just like Elijah, never heard of him, suddenly he's here, tells Ahab no more in for three years. Now we suddenly have this Obadiah. Well, there's a book in the Bible named after him, right? That's not this Obadiah. That's a different Obadiah. Um, I don't know their last names, but this is not he. 
So first off, the name Obadiah means servant of Jehovah. Servant of Jehovah. Uh, sometimes, you know, for us, I don't look at, I don't look at uh, uh, Sandy. I don't know what your name means. Do you know what Sandra means? No? Does anyone know what their name means? Deborah? I think it means Queen Bee. Queen Bee. Now see, we look at Deborah because we don't know the meanings of the names. We don't look at them and think of the meaning of their name. But biblical days, the meanings of their names were more evident to people. People would be aware. That's why Jabez, remember the prayer of Jabez? His name meant pain. <laughs> like you'd name your child pain. Yes. What is? Sorrow. Oh, Deborah. Means what? Pain and sorrow. Pain? Yes. Sorrow. And you named your daughter that? Yeah, I didn't know it. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, but the point is, when we look at Dolores, so, until now, now we do, but before now, we didn't look at her and say, well, someone called her pain. Yeah. <laughs> Sharon means harmonious. It also means princess, because Sarah, it's a form of Sarah. Sandra might be a form of Sarah, too, I think. Anyway, we don't look at each other and go, oh, her name is Rosa. She's, like, named after thorns. I mean, roses. <laughs> you know, we don't look at that. But in Bible days, they had more awareness of what their names meant. And so imagine Ahab. Every time he has to call his head servant Obadiah, he's saying servant of Jehovah, while Ahab is totally rejecting Jehovah. But... Obadiah didn't. Obadiah's name he lived up to. He was a servant of Jehovah. We also know that he was, quote, over the household, over the household of Ahab. This likely is, is like a manager, a financial business household manager. But he's, he's certainly, um, he's probably some sort of administrator. But he is certainly trusted by Ahab because of all his household, all the people he could have taken with him. He could have taken his general. He could have taken anyone with him to go out and say, okay, you go that way and I'll go this way and see if we can find water for our animals. He chose Obadiah. And so Obadiah was trusted by the king. So now he's a servant of God and he's working for the most wicked king in all of Israel's history. That's probably challenging. And, and uh, Ahab's wife, Jezebel, the queen, has brought in, she tried to destroy the prophets of God and brought in her own prophets of Baal, the false god. But in the midst of this, we also learn this about Obadiah. He feared the Lord greatly. Now, this is not a trembling fear. This is the right fear. This is the fear of the Lord that we need. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is what we need in order to please God. We need the fear of the Lord. That's a, a recognition of who God is. And so Obadiah not only had a fear of the Lord, he feared the Lord greatly. And so this is telling us about his spiritual condition. He was a follower of God. Remember, these are Jewish people. They're not following God. They are God's people by nationality, even though they're not living as God's people. This is the kingdom of Israel. The Israel and Judah divided after Solomon. Um, one of Solomon's sons, Rehoboam, took two of the tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and became their king. And another one, not related, named Rehoboam, I mean Jeroboam, why they had them rhyme, I don't know. It would have been nice if their names had nothing to do with each other. Jeroboam, he took the other ten tribes and started another kingdom. That kingdom we call Israel, and the one that had David's descendants we call Judah after their split. So these stories about Elijah and Elisha are about the kingdom of Israel, the ungodly ones, the non, the ones that didn't follow God. 
okay? So, and they did idol worshiping and such. So in the midst of that, he feared God greatly. It, you know, it's interesting, I was looking at several resources as I'm studying, and there's two opinions of Obadiah. There are two different opinions of Obadiah. About half the scholars consider him to be a courageous servant of God. He was a courageous servant of God. He hid and fed 100 prophets wanted by Jezebel. Now that can't be good for his career if he got found out that the queen that he works for is trying to destroy them and he's hiding them and keeping them food. I don't know where he'd where he get a food for 100. From the palace? I don't know. That would be God's sense of humor, right? Is to be busy, busy using the palace itself to help his people survive. So some believe that, and I, I'm in that court. I'm in that group. But some actually say he was a timid compromiser. That Ahab didn't know he was godly. That Ahab didn't know he feared the Lord because he didn't let it be known. And he was afraid to let his godly faith be known. That he was actually compromising. He should have had nothing to do with Ahab, these say. He should have said, I'm serving God. I can't serve an ungodly king. I can't work for Jezebel, who is trying to destroy the prophets of God. That's what some think. I don't know what you think. Doesn't matter. Because here's an important truth that we can learn here. And, and we're going to close with this. Don't judge. We could just end there because Jesus says don't judge. But we'll go on and give specifics here. Don't judge how God chooses to use someone else. Don't judge how God chooses to use someone else just because it's not how he uses us. Don't judge how God chooses to use someone else just because it's not how he uses us. I think it's an important thing to know that God is the master. He's the Lord of each one of his children and each one of his followers. But he may direct each of us to work for him in different ways. And because he tells me to work in one way and you a different way, we don't judge you because it's what you're doing, what your master says to do. Romans 14.4, Paul asks this, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or fails, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. See, we work for the Lord, we serve the Lord, and we serve him. He's a very personal Lord. He's a very personal Lord. And what he calls me to do, all of it will line up with the word of God. I'm not saying someone can do sin or something different. Say, well, that's what God wants me to do. That wouldn't do that. God always stays true to his word. But if someone chooses to serve a little differently than you do, or than I do, we have to recognize they have to answer to God. And it's God that they, in front of, before his own master, that he stands or fails. And in this case, some of these scholars, they're judging Obadiah. And they're saying to me, they f I feel like they're saying, if you really feared God greatly, you should have nothing to do with King Ahab. You certainly can't be in his household. But I say, whatever God called Obadiah to do, whatever else is going on, God's used him in his position probably to save a hundred prophets of God. God had a different plan and who we work for. And not only is this a, a reminder to us not to judge, but to remember who we're working for. We're working for our Lord and Master, our Jesus Christ. And we have to work out how he wants us to serve, no matter what other people think. And it may not look just like they, how they serve, but we have to answer to him. One of my favorite verses of the many favorites is John 6:44. I'd look it up on my phone, but I'm talking to my phone. In essence, it says John 
That's where I hope it is. And I hope it says, how can you believe? He says to the, fair, to the people listening to him, And they're really small numbers. Nope, that's not it. It <laughs> might be 544. I didn't think 6 sounded right at first. I'm so glad this is recorded. <laughs> How can you believe? 544, sorry. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. How can you really say you believe, Jesus said, if what you're looking for is what men think? You want their glory instead of God's glory. And we work for him. So we both need to make sure we're looking for God's glory and not the glory of men and not judge others who God might use in a different way for his glory than he uses us. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, we'll close in prayer. Well, Lord, I thank you that you are such a personal God. You made us individuals. You formed us from the dust. You breathed life into us. You made us in your image. And, Lord, I thank you that we can know you in a personal way. And that you know us, you formed us, you made us, and you have plans for us that are not like anyone else's. And so, Lord, I pray that we'll look to you, that you direct us, look our, let our lives be lived to please you and not anyone who might be watching. And help us to give others the freedom to do the same. I thank you, Lord, that you're that personal and involved in our lives every day. Help us to always live for you and to always Always bring you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.